breakfast, the periodic table. The periodic table is a table of all the known elements, organised according to their properties and their atomic structure. The periodic table shows each element by its chemical symbol. Understanding the periodic table and the information it contains will help make chemistry more logical. This next clip explains some of the patterns using a reduced form of the periodic table. If the elements are arranged in order of atomic number, some interesting patterns can be picked out. For instance, these elements are all gases at room temperature. This property disappears and reappears at intervals. It seems that these properties aren't just mixed up any old way, there's a pattern. Similar patterns can be seen in the chemical properties of the elements. For instance, these elements are all metals, they conduct electricity. And these are non-metals, they don't conduct electricity. And some elements don't fit easily into either category. The elements are laid out in the periodic table in order of increasing atomic number. The table is arranged in groups, up and down the table, and periods across the table. Each group contains elements that have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. The main groups are numbered from group 1 to group 8, sometimes called group 0, which usually indicates how many electrons there are in the outer shell of all the elements in that group. Thus, all the elements in group 1 have one electron in their outer shell, and all the elements in group 2 have two electrons in their outer shell, and so on. The periods across the table represent which electron shell is filling up. Shell 1, shell 2, shell 3, and so on. Because they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell, elements in the same group have similar properties. The periodic table helps us understand and predict all kinds of patterns of chemical behaviour. That's because chemical behaviour is related to the arrangement of electrons. Now we'll look at the parts of the periodic table you need to know about. The group 1 alkali metals the group 7 halogens and the group 8 noble gases. First, the group 1 alkali metals. Let's look at the pattern of chemical behaviour shown by these group 1 metals lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium and cesium. Watch this classic clip and note down how these metals react and think about why this might be. Here for example is lithium. When we slice it, you can see the metallic luster, but the black coating quickly reappears. Sodium is kept under oil to prevent reaction with air. Again, when we cut it, the metal surface can be seen, but this time corrosion occurs even more quickly. With the next alkali metal, potassium, the corrosion in air is so quick that it's hard to see the metallic luster at all. As we go down the group, the elements seem to react more quickly with air. Now let's see another reaction of the alkali metals, the reaction with water. We'll start with lithium. The metal floats on the water and reacts with it, giving off hydrogen gas. Now for sodium. The same sort of thing happens, although the reaction is a bit more vigorous. All the alkali metals react with water in the same way. Now for potassium. This time you'll see a flame. The heat given out by the reaction is produced so quickly that the hydrogen gas catches fire. It burns with a lilac flame. The next element is rubidium. This time, we put a safety screen between us and the reaction. You can see that things gradually become more terrifying as we go down the group. Let's try cesium, our fifth alkali metal.
As you saw, all the alkali metals are very reactive, and their reactivity increases as we go down the group. When added to water, lithium floats and fizzes, giving off hydrogen. Sodium also floats, but skims across the water surface, also fizzing and giving off hydrogen. Potassium floats as well, but so much heat is produced it sets the hydrogen alight. Rubidium reacts very violently, producing sparks and flying fragments. And cesium explodes violently, smashing the glass container. Why are they all so reactive? By their position in group 1 of the periodic table, we know they've all got one electron in their outer shell. Lithium has two and one electrons. Sodium has two eight and one electrons. Potassium has two eight eight and one electrons and so on. In each case, the outer electron is desperate to combine with something else, which is why the alkali metals are so reactive. But why are the metals more reactive as they go down the group? It's because each successive metal has one more electron shell which puts that single outer electron further away from the positive nucleus. That makes the bonding weaker, so the single electron can more easily combine with something else, which makes each element more reactive than the one before. The next group you need to know about is group 7, the halogens. The group 7 halogens is another group of highly reactive elements near the other end of the periodic table. The most common ones are fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Watch the next clip and see if you can work out why these halogens are so reactive. In this model, the most reactive elements are shown the tallest. Group 1 elements sit at one peak of reactivity. But way across at the far side, elements in another group are just as keen to react. Here is group 7. If you were to start at fluorine, well, you wouldn't get very far. I mean, that really is the most reactive gas in the periodic table. And indeed, it took ages for chemists actually to, to isolate it because it was so reactive. Suppose that you got round that problem and put yourself in a spacesuit that enabled you to survive. You would actually see a very interesting countryside as you, as you walked down the group. You would see fluorine as this rather delicately pale green, almost colourless gas. Then you go into a, a region of slightly darker colour, greenish yellow chlorine. Then you come to a, really a deep brownish red lake bromine. And then on the other shore of that lake there is um, purple, violet, black crystals of iodine. It really is a, a very beautiful walk to take. It's the most colourful part of the periodic kingdom. Colourful but highly reactive. Group 7 elements are dangerous to humans. During the First World War chlorine gas was used as a weapon it reacted with the water in soldiers' eyes to form bleach and hydrochloric acid. Thousands were blinded. The reason chlorine was such a horrific weapon is locked inside its atoms. Two electrons are all it takes to fill the inner shell, but the next one out can hold up to eight. In chlorine, it's filled, but the third shell isn't. Again, it's got room for eight, but with only seven spaces occupied, chlorine has a gap which it is desperate to fill. And that's why it is so reactive. So why are the halogens so reactive? By their position in group seven of the periodic table, we know they've all got seven electrons in their outer shell. Fluorine has two and seven electrons. Chlorine has two eight and seven electrons. Bromine has two eight 18 and seven electrons and so on. In each case, that one missing outer electron makes each halogen desperate to combine with something else, which is why they're so reactive. But why do the halogens get less reactive as they go down the group? It's because each successive halogen has one more electron shell, which puts the gap for a missing outer electron further away from the positive nucleus. The further away, 
the weaker the bonding, so it's more difficult to attract an electron from another atom to fill the gap. The last group in the periodic table you need to know about is the group 8 noble gases, sometimes called group 0. The group 8 noble gases are all at the extreme right-hand end of the periodic table and include helium, neon, argon, krypton and xenon. How do you expect them to react with other elements? The goal of every element is to fill its outer shell of electrons. But one group of elements has already got there, group 8, on the far right of the periodic table. Really, there's not much to see here and very little going on. These are the so-called noble gases. Right at the bottom, we have radon. And not much is known about radon, except that it's intensely radioactive, which is why people don't like to investigate its properties. A bit further up, you get to um, gases like xenon and krypton, argon and neon. Uh, these are gases that are, are used in well, advertising signs and in lasers and so on. But they were once called the inert gases because chemists, when they were first discovered, thought that they simply didn't react at all. Now we know that's not always true. But the Group 8 gases still hide away in the periodic table because they're so unreactive. So by their position in group 8 of the periodic table, we know that each of the noble gases has a full outer shell of electrons. Helium has two electrons, neon has two and eight electrons, argon has two, eight and eight electrons, and so on. That full outer shell makes them all extremely unreactive. But just like the alkali metals and the halogens, their properties do change as you move down the group. Take the noble gases. There's not much chemistry to see, but there are changes in their physical properties. For instance, in their density. A balloon filled with helium rises quickly. A neon-filled balloon rises slowly. An argon balloon falls slowly. Krypton is denser still and xenon is the densest of all. In this case, the density of each noble gas increases as you move down the group from one gas to another. Quite often, properties like boiling points and melting points change progressively as you move down a group of elements. Now, how do things change along a horizontal period? This clip shows how fluorine reacts as you go along the period from sodium to sulphur. This is fluorine and sodium. The reaction's fairly lively. So is the reaction between magnesium and fluorine. And now aluminium powder and fluorine. This is silicon and fluorine. This is phosphorus and fluorine. And this is sulphur. It may not look it, but there is a pattern. A pattern in the formula of the compounds. In the case of sodium, one sodium atom combines with one fluorine atom. For magnesium, one atom combines with two of fluorine. For aluminium, it's one and three. And so a pattern emerges. But why do the elements react in this way? Sodium in group one has one free electron in its outer shell, so it combines with one atom of fluorine. Magnesium in group two has two free electrons in its outer shell, so it combines with two atoms of fluorine and so on. Another interesting part of the periodic table is the large area between the two extreme sides. They are called transition metals. 
their properties change as you move across the table. The long skinny bit in the middle of the periodic kingdom, um, which well, chemists don't call it the long skinny bit, they call it the transition metals, um, is really interesting because in a sense it captures the progress of civilization. If you start on the far right, copper and zinc were the metals that were used for the Bronze Age. And as you gradually walk your way towards the left, you come to iron, which of course was the later Iron Age. If you go further across still, you get to elements like titanium. And of course, titanium is the material that makes space travel possible, light and strong and durable. The clip explained that these transition metals were first isolated and made use of from right to left along this period. This is because each metal is more reactive than the next, so each one was more difficult to isolate from other compounds they react with. So to summarise, it's really important for your exam to know why the periodic table is arranged the way it is. Especially why the elements are arranged in groups, how the group 1 alkali metals react and why, the group 7 halogens and their reactions, and the properties of the group 8, sometimes called group 0, noble gases. Here are some questions about the periodic table. Identify an element in the periodic table that has two electrons in its outer shell. Any element in group 2 has two electrons in its outer shell, so you could have said beryllium, magnesium, calcium, etc. Identify an element which combines with hydrogen to form a colourless, acidic gas. Any element in group 7 reacts with hydrogen to form hydrogen halides, which are gases which dissolve in water to make acids. So you could have said chlorine, which reacts with hydrogen to form acidic hydrogen chloride gas, or fluorine, bromine, iodine, etc. Identify a group 7 halogen that will react with an aqueous solution of sodium bromide. The halogens become more reactive as you go up group 7, and a more reactive halogen will displace a less reactive one from a solution of its salt. So we're looking for a halogen that's higher up the group than bromine, that's either chlorine or fluorine. Find an element that forms ions with a double negative charge. Non-metals form ions by gaining electrons. Metals form ions by losing electrons. Metal ions in groups 1 to 3 have the same positive charge as their group number. Non-metal ions in groups 5 to 7 have the same negative charge as their group number, minus 8. Therefore, any group 6 element has 6 minus 8, that's negative 2 ions. Which noble gas in this periodic table has the lowest boiling point? For the noble gases in group 8, the boiling point increases as the size of the atoms increases. Helium, at the top of the group, has the smallest atom, with one shell with two electrons. So helium must have the lowest boiling point. Finally, select an element that will react more vigorously at room temperature with chlorine than sodium does. Sodium is an alkali metal in group 1. The further an element is down group 1, the more vigorous is its reaction with chlorine. Potassium is further down group 1 than sodium, and so it will react more vigorously, as will rubidium, cesium and so on. That's the end of the section on the periodic table.